Hi everyone, this lesson's on gene regulation. I want us to think back to feedback inhibition, specifically allosteric feedback. A reminder that this is how cells regulated metabolic pathways. You would have a precursor molecule, which will then cause a cascade of enzymatic activity to produce some kind of end product. In this example, it is tryptophan. The quantity of the tryptophan actually can act as an allosteric inhibitor to shut down the entire process. So thinking globally, the purpose of this is just to have a measure of regulation to turn things on or off. But the problem is that's pretty wasteful production of enzymes. A lot of enzymes are going to continuously be produced until that inhibition triggers. So the solution to this is to regulate the genes that code for those enzymes instead. Each enzyme in that metabolic pathway has a gene that goes through transcription and translation to produce it. Instead of having tryptophan shut down the enzymatic pathway, we can have some precursor, some molecules such as tryptophan or a transcription factor turn the gene on or off. That way the enzyme doesn't have to be produced at all. It's going to save a lot of energy and a lot of materials. So thinking of protein synthesis, a quick note that it does vary a little bit between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have a variety of ways of processing mRNA such as exons and introns and SNRPs and the GTP cap, whereas prokaryotic cells just go through transcription and translation. So looking at how genes are regulated, how they're turned on or off, it is different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So I'm going to first teach you how prokaryotes, bacteria, regulate their genes, and then we'll look at the complex ways that eukaryotes regulate. So thinking of prokaryotes, how does a bacteria eat? It doesn't really have a mouth. Well, if there's some molecule present that it wants to take in, it's going to need some kind of a transport protein to move those materials into the cell to be digested. Looking at the example of milk, milk contains the sugar lactose, which is a disaccharide. Once that disaccharide enters the bacteria, it's not going to be able to digest it. Bacteria can only digest monosaccharides. So to break this apart, the bacteria is going to need some kind of an enzyme such as lactase, that can break that lactose down into the monosaccharides glucose and galactose. So let's imagine wild bacteria encounter some milk. What is it going to need to make in order to get that milk in? It's going to need to make some kind of a transport protein. It's also going to need to make enzymes to break it down. How is it going to do this? Protein synthesis. There's a gene that's going to be transcribed and translated to produce the transport protein and to produce the enzymes needed to digest the milk. But something has to indicate to that bacteria that the sugar is present. Lactose is there and needs to be digested. It's going to be a ligand that does that. Cell signaling is going to trigger this activity. So when we look at gene regulation, I want you to think of this as the accumulation of so much that we've learned. Cell communication is going to be triggering genes to turn on or off, which will go through protein synthesis and then be used for enzymatic metabolic pathways for digestion, such as anaerobic respiration or aerobic respiration. So why have a regulation measure in the first place? Cells are constantly needing to maintain homeostasis. You need to have the right internal conditions and the right amount of substances being produced or digested. So this regulation provides an on off switch that's stop or go to keep all the substances in the right numerical value they need to be. Let's look at the anatomy of a gene for a prokaryote. Prokaryotes often have something called an operon. Operons are genes grouped together with a related function. In this diagram, you can see trip E, trip D, trip C. These are all different genes that share the same overarching function of producing the molecule tryptophan. In front of that, you can see a promoter. A promoter is where RNA polymerase is going to bind. A reminder that RNA polymerase is the enzyme that's going to convert DNA into RNA for transcription. There's also a region called the operator between the promoter and the operon. This is the binding site of something called a repressor, I'll show you in a moment, that's able to turn genes off. The way this is all set up, this would be a gene that has its go switched on, a gene that's able to undergo transcription and translation to produce the enzymes needed for metabolic pathway. What if I want to turn the gene off? To do that, there's something called a repressor protein. A repressor protein can bind at the operator. 
that space between the promoter and the gene. Once it's bound, it prevents RNA polymerase from attaching and transcribing, effectively turning the gene off. So bacteria use repressors to turn genes off, remove the repressor to turn genes on. Here you can see that model in action. So RNA polymerase, when everything's going well, will read the genes. It will then produce mRNA. That mRNA is going to contain the code for each gene, which can then be translated to produce the enzymes in our metabolic pathway. This is the gene being turned on. To turn the gene off, a repressor binds to the operator. Once that repressor is bound, RNA polymerase now can't go any further than the promoter. It'll attach to the ta, -ta box and then bounce right off. So none of the mRNA is made, none of the enzymes in the pathway are made. There are two different pathways for genes to be turned on or off based on this operon model. One's called the repressible operon and the other is called the inducible. Let's look at each. For the repressible operon, let's look at the production of tryptophan. Repressible operons are also known as synthesis pathways. These are pathways where we're building something and having an excess product is what's going to regulate the gene being on or off. So here, the gene's turned on, RNA polymerase reads the genes, makes an mRNA transcript for each one, which will then be translated to produce enzymes and get us our end product of tryptophan. Once enough tryptophan has been made, that tryptophan can act as an inhibitor by attaching to the repressor. In a repressible operon, the end product attaches to the repressor, and that's what stimulates the repressor to bind to the operator. Once that repressor is bound, this gene is now turned off. Now that it's turned off, it's not going to be able to do any transcription or translation. This will remain off until tryptophan starts to get used up. Once that tryptophan gets used up and then we dip below the level we need, that tryptophan detaches from the repressor and flies off. Now let's look at the second model, the inducible operon. An inducible operon, instead of dealing with building something, is dealing with digesting something. These are digestive pathways where things are broken down. This operon begins with the repressor attached. The gene starts being turned off, different than the last one, where we saw the gene started with it being turned on. What's gonna remove the repressor in a digestive pathway? It's gonna be the presence of the molecule to be digested. This operon is known as the LAC operon. In this instance, lactose is going to be present in the cell. Cell wants to break that down, wants to break apart that lactose into monosaccharides to be digested. Lactose can bind to the repressor and in doing so, will cause the repressor to be removed. Once that repressor is removed by the presence of lactose, RNA polymerase can now go through, turn the gene on, build the mRNA transcript, and build all of the protein products that will come from it. In this case, it's gonna be enzymes that digest lactose. In doing this, that lactose gets broken down. Remember, what removed the repressor was the lactose. So as it gets gobbled up more and more and more, that lactose on the repressor is going to be digested, and that'll cause the repressor to reattach, turning the gene off. Why all this complex steps? Well, this makes sure that we're only making digestive enzymes when we have something to digest, that it's not wasteful. Let's watch a review of the lac operon just to make sure we understand all the components that are involved. The E. coli lac operon is an example of an inducible set of genes. These genes are responsible for the breakdown of lactose into sugars used for cellular metabolism. This inducible system also involves bacterial DNA, a repressor, mRNA, and the sugar molecule lactose. This animation will only focus on two of the three proteins encoded by the LAC operon, beta-galactosidase and permease. Gene expression can be induced or turned on when a specific inducer molecule appears in a cell.
For inducible systems, a repressor molecule prevents gene expression by binding to the upstream controlling region. Lactose is the lac operon inducer molecule. After first appearing in the cellular environment, lactose passively enters the E. coli cell and binds to the repressor molecule. This binding releases the repressor from the controlling region. At this point, RNA polymerase can begin transcription of the operon. Here we show two of the three lac operon genes being transcribed into mRNA. Ribosomes then bind to the mRNA and the two proteins are translated. The first protein is beta-galactosidase, which breaks down lactose into two simple sugars. The second protein is permease, a membrane-bound protein. When embedded in the cell membrane, permease functions to provide a direct route for the lactose outside the cell to be imported into the cell. This import occurs at a much greater rate than the passive transfer we first observed. Because translation continues inside the cell, other permease proteins become embedded in the membrane. This further increases the rate at which lactose enters the cell. Beta-galactosidase breaks the cellular lactose into the simple sugars glucose and galactose. Once its concentration is greatly reduced, the lactose bound to the repressor are released. At this point, the repressor again binds to the controlling region and gene expression is halted. For all inducible systems like the lac operon, it is the interaction of the repressor and inducer molecules that mediate gene expression. So as a review, we have two methods for bacterial operons. We have a repressible operon, where it begins with the gene turned on, and then too much of the product is what turns it off. That's different than the inducible operon, which begins off with the operator attached, and the presence of the molecule to be digested is what's gonna cause it to be removed. With repressible operon, this is typically a synthetic pathway, so it's anabolic, and the inducible operon, it's digestive, so it's catabolic. So let's look now at eukaryotic gene regulation. Eukaryotic genome is complex. There are quite a few steps that occur during transcription and translation. Genes can be regulated for a eukaryotic organism at any step along this pathway. That means when packing or unpacking the DNA, during transcription, during mRNA processing, transporting the mRNA, translation, and even when the protein is being folded and built. So let's look at how eukaryotes can regulate it in each step. First is DNA packaging. There are two to three meters of DNA that fit in one nucleus. That is a lot of DNA packaging. It's good to always remember that DNA is coiled and folded around nucleosomes and histones, becoming dense chromatin fiber. When it's compressed, it can't be expressed. Here you can see nucleosomes, those structures that DNA are wrapping around. Think of it like beads on a string. This is what's keeping that DNA condensed. This packaging can be used as a method of control. The degree that it's wrapped around determines if it can be transcribed or not. When DNA is wrapped, tightly wrapped around histones and nucleosomes, it can't be unwound. We can't have RNA polymerase go in and build an mRNA transcript so the gene is turned off. So that's one way of regulating, just keeping the DNA tightly wound. Another way is something called DNA methylation. Adding a methyl group, CH3, to a cytosine actually will turn a gene off. This has been the development of a huge field called epigenetics. For a long time, we thought that your genes are internal, passed down, and that's what determines if they're expressed or not. But it turns out items in your environment, such as methyl groups, can turn genes on or off as well. Histones can also be acetylated as a method of regulation. Adding an acetyl group to a histone causes the DNA to unwind. By unwinding it, you are enabling it to be expressed. So this acetylation is one way you can turn a eukaryotic gene on. Another way to regulate is at the very beginning of transcription. Reminder that RNA polymerase and transcription factors have to attach to a promoter for transcription to begin. Well, these transcription factors, since they're needed there to start the whole thing, are another mechanism for turning a gene on or turning it off. 
Another way is to use the enhancer region. The enhancer region is that region upstream before the promoter that can have items bind or not bind to make transcription go. For example, here you can see a model of enhancer activity in the eukaryotic genome. Right here we have an enhancer that's empty, a promoter that's empty, and a gene. Notice at step two, transcription factors enter in, and those transcription factors are attaching to the enhancer. Specifically, transcription factors called activators are able to attach to the enhancer, which will then stimulate transcription to begin. You can have the opposite as well. You can have proteins called silencers that will attach to the enhancer and prevent transcription from beginning. One thing that's very unique about the eukaryotic genome is notice how the DNA is pulled down into a loop. That doesn't happen in prokaryotes, it only happens in eukaryotes. Here you can see the entire complex at once. This is the initiation complex at a promoter site. If the gene is turned on and ready to do transcription, you're going to have transcription factors, RNA polymerase, and activators attached to enhancers to pull that upstream portion down to begin transcription. To turn it off, instead of activators, silencers could have been added to the enhancers. Another method of control is post-transcriptional. Let's say you've made your mRNA, but you want something different to be produced. You can do alternative splicing. When we have our premature mRNA transcript that's made of exons and introns, SNRPs can regulate how those pieces are cut and glued together. That can be used to have one gene expressed and another not be expressed. Let's say we go even further and we've made our mRNA transcript, it's mature, I've cut out our introns. Well, you can regulate how many copies of a protein are made by determining how long the poly A tail is. Having a long poly A tail will cause that mRNA to last much longer and produce more proteins, or you can make a very short poly A tail and that will shorten the duration or how many proteins are ultimately produced. SIRNA is yet another way to regulate. Let's say you've made your mature transcript, it's gone out into the cytosol, but eh, we want to silence that. SIRNAs can do that. These are short segments of RNA, only 21 to 28 bases, that can bind to mRNA and tag it for destruction. This causes mRNA to degrade before it reaches a ribosome to be translated. So it effectively silences a gene that's already been transcribed. Pretty cool. Here you can just see that in action. SIRNAs go out into the cytosol, attach to that mRNA transcript, and cause it to be broken down by enzymes. The mRNA is then degraded and never read. Now let's say we go all the way to translation and we begin that process. Well, to block the initiation, reminder that you need that GTP cap. You can prevent the attachment of ribosomal subunits and the, the first or initiating tRNA as soon as it arrives at the ribosome. This is another way you can silence a gene before it's expressed. And let's say you go all the way to producing your protein product. Eukaryotes still have ways to regulate that. There are molecules that are able to attach to proteins and cause them to degrade. Ubiquitin and proteasomes are able to attach and destroy proteins that are produced. So let's review all the ways that the eukaryotic genome can be regulated. We have two items that occurred during transcription. Where with DNA packaging, we're able to acetylate a histone in order to open it up or add a methyl group to a cytosine to turn the gene off. We're also able to use transcription factors that can attach to enhancers or silencers to turn the gene off. There are also modifications that you can make post-transcription. Post-transcription, you can have alternative splicing and you can also regulate how much that mRNA is protected, how long that poly A tail is, determines how many copies of the protein will be made. You also have things like siRNAs that are able in the cytosol to attach to an mRNA product and have it be triggered, triggered to be destroyed. During translation, we can also block the initiation of translation, and if translation is successful, we're able to use various molecules to degrade or destroy the protein that was made. I hope this was helpful in your understanding of prokaryotic and eukaryotic gene regulation, and I'll see you next time.